This is Colin Cattell with Palisade Radio. On the show with us this week is Jim Paterson. Jim is the CEO of Kavalik Energy and an expert on the uranium sector. Jim, welcome to the program. Thank you, Colin. I appreciate it. Today is Wednesday, April 22nd. Just a few hours ago, a Japanese court rejected a legal bid to block the reopening of the Sendai nuclear power station. I think some investors were caught off guard. In fact, I know that they were caught off guard because uranium stock shot up 5 to 15% across the board today. And with this court ruling in hand, the Sendai reactor is set to open as early as June of this year. One reactor going online does not create a strong supply crunch, but it might symbolize something much more to come. What do you think that this symbolizes for Japan and for the uranium sector in general? Well, I think that the scenario in Japan has been dragged out, and it's been long, and it's been slightly confusing for everyone else in the world to understand. I think the main thing to remember is that uh, there's going to be false starts along the way here because there's lots of people involved in the decision-making and restart process in Japan. But uh, as generally you can say that nuclear is in Japan's energy mix and a component of it, and that caused a a run a little while ago in the market prices of uranium companies because they actually could then see from from a government perspective, from a policy perspective, that nuclear would be included. But I, frankly, um, I think the biggest impact will be when the first reactors actually start burning fuel. Whether that's in June or July, whenever it is, that for me is really when the switch gets turned on. That's a good point you make. We had Rick Rule on the program last week, and I know his opinion on uranium of late is a bit bearish, at least for the near term. He voiced concern that the softening oil prices and natural gas prices over the last few months might actually relieve pressure from the Japanese government on restarting uranium as the price advantage decrease. Do you see a meaningful relationship between the oil, natural gas prices, and nuclear, or do you see them as completely separate things at this point? Well, I think that they're all intertwined, obviously. You know, if you look at the the spreading of risk and the costs associated with different sources of energy, you, you need to have a mix in, a, in a, an industrialized nation needs the base load power. They also, if they have any sort of wealth as a country, generally they're going to have a real aptitude or preponderance to try to have green sources of power as well. So all these things are in the mix. Nuclear was a major component of of uh, Japan's energy mix before Fukushima, and it was supposed to get bigger and grow. And obviously, the earthquake, tsunami, and the Fukushima incident slowed that down considerably. Um, but I think that uh, the Japanese have paid dearly from their shutdown of the reactors in terms of their import costs to bring the petrochemicals into power the nation. So it's costing them, uh, but they haven't yet demonstrated the political will to move quickly and decisively. So we hope that reactor restarts uh, will have a really positive effect. I think a lot of uranium bulls, if a lot still exist, want to play down the disaster at Fukushima. And I, of course, have not visited the site, but from all the footage I've seen, call it ground zero at Fukushima, it seems to be a bit of a disaster. There's no question that there's some nuclear waste that's leaking, potentially leaking into the ocean. What do you see the Fukushima disaster causing for the uranium sector in the coming years, or do you think that most of the damage has been done? I think that the earthquake and the tsunami had major disastrous effects in Japan, just irrespective of the nuclear reactor. I recommend that your listeners watch the movie called Pandora's Promise. And I think that gives a good balanced perspective of radioactivity around the world in different settings. And it actually has some footage where the, the, one of the main characters or the narrator of that film actually visits the Fukushima site. And I don't think they really hold back. Um, However, we don't know in the end, what the ramifications will be, but I can tell you that there has been massive ramifications in Japan, um, and not just due to nuclear, but in, due to flooding, tidal waves. Um, there, it was obviously something that was very damaging to the country, and it wasn't just the nuclear power plant that, effect, that you know, wasn't solely responsible for those effects. 
I'll second that recommendation on the movie Pandora's. What was it called again? Pandora's Box, or what did they call it? It's called Pandora's Promise, and it's quite easily accessible over the web. Yeah, no, that was a great movie, and it was presented by several environmentalists or previous environmentalists that were actually pro-nuclear at this point, and that seems to be a shift that's occurring. What do you see from the environmental side on resistance to nuclear power? Of course, in the case of Fukushima, they shouldn't be building or leaving an operating nuclear power plant that's 50 years old on an active fault line. With that aside, what are you seeing on the environmental side? Well, it's funny that you chose those words because I think you can be an environmentalist and support nuclear power. So you don't have to be a former environmentalist to support nuclear power because of the, the, the carbon footprint that nuclear lacks. And I also think that, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be cheeky when I tell you that I, I would consider the nuclear business the most safety conscious business in the entire world. And I, I'm, I'm not joking about that statement. Because when things go wrong in the nuclear business, firstly, there's serious danger to humanity, but also the fallout can be tremendous in terms of economic ruin for the industry. Even if um, things get blown out of proportion and people don't really understand what has happened and maybe things get overplayed in the end, the perception can be massively damaging. So it's a very safety conscious business. And in particular in the U.S., where there's over 100 reactors, there's never been a death associated with a nuclear reactor. And you can't say that about other industries. Yeah, compared to oil or coal, it's a much safer industry and it gets a bad rep, probably due to the fact that uranium has been used for weapons in the past, but from a fuel standpoint, it's quite safe. I want to ask you, Jim, because you've been in the market for a long time with uranium. You're the CEO of a uranium company called Kavalik Energy. But listeners of Palisade Radio are aware of my feelings towards the sector. Uranium, aside from maybe rare earths, is the most volatile of all the commodity sectors. And there are very few assets around the world, meaning there are very few companies for investors to look at. And when nobody's interested, you get the scenario play out that we see today. But as soon as a little money starts rushing into the sector, you got to watch out because 10 times gains in under a year can be the norm here, at least when things start. What does your experience tell you about how the market might react or what you see coming in the next few years? I don't know. I think a good comparison, I'm hoping, this is what I'm hoping, obviously I'm completely biased, but I'm hoping that 2015 is a bit of a repeat of 2010. And I say that for a couple of different reasons. At the beginning of 2010, there was market apathy towards uranium companies and uranium stocks, and the spot price was hovering around the $42 US dollar per pound. Um, it's around that same level today. It's just a little under $40 a pound. There's some app, I, I guess you could call it apathy in the marketplace. But exactly what you said happened, Colin. Prices started moving on the term markets for uranium, and the spot market started following suit. And the, price, the spot price started gapping on a weekly basis up from 42 all the way to $70 a pound near the end of the year. And market caps of companies in the uranium space definitely went up 10 times or more. And it was just because of what you're saying, the, the number of companies in the, involved with uranium mining development or exploration where they actually have delineated a deposit is literally 30, uh, 30 or so companies on a global basis. So when all the hot money rushes into a sector, it, it needs to find a home. And the number of uranium companies out there that actually have viable projects is very slim. So they do tend to get overbought. Um, the opposite happens when there's apathy. You know, they completely get oversold. And we've been through an oversold scenario since, two, since after Fukushima in 2011. We are at today almost the same scenario in terms of plants, nuclear power plants under construction, planned or proposed as we were before Fukushima. So it's taken uh, four years, you know, that kind of healing process has happened in the industry and the industry is getting its legs again. However, uh, the valuations of the companies in the uranium business is nowhere near where it was just before Fukushima. So there's some room to move here, I think. 
Absolutely, and you mentioned mining development or exploration. Once again, you're gonna be biased a bit here, but how do investors play the sector? You have Cameco at the top, development companies in the middle, and then exploration companies at the bottom, the same as any mining sector would work. What are your suggestions to a novice investor here? Um, I, I think there's a, a couple different ways to play it. There aren't that many ETFs. There's a couple of ETFs, so maybe we, afterwards you could put a link to those two ETFs on your website or, or companies that sort of track across the sector from exploration to uh, development and production. There's uh, uranium participation, which is effectively a holder of a physical commodity, either U308 or UF6, which is another form of nuclear fuel. You can buy um, Areva, which is traded over in Europe, or Cameco, which is probably the best pure play in the marketplace in terms of a miner. Then you've got the development companies, uh, excuse me, then you've got the, uh, the ISR type producers and there's three or four high quality names that are traded on U.S. stock exchanges and Canadian stock exchanges if they're dual listed. They're U.S. developers and producers of ISR uranium. And then you've got projects around the world, um, development projects that are in Africa and some in Australia. And those, those projects are held by companies that are either traded on Australian stock exchanges, London stock exchanges, or North American stock exchanges. So, you know, if you want to pick um, an individual company, you've got a few choices. If you want to pick a, a fund or an ETF to, to hold a basket, you can do that, or you can hold the individual commodity, like uranium participation, um, or you can do a pure play, like a, something like a Cameco. One last point I want to make, Jim, before we end the interview. It's kind of an interesting situation I see in that you have Russia vertically integrating nuclear power plants across the world, construction, finance, and supply. China is busy establishing what will become the largest nuclear-powered country. And even the United States is still producing 20% of their power from nuclear and looks to be adding to that in the coming years. What other commodity in the world is supported by such fundamentals and so cheap right now? Is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> I'm joking. Um, no, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I really think, I've said this before, it's, it's a growth industry, and it's not one that's wildly parabolic growing or growth, it's, but it's steady, strong growth. And the thing about reactors is that, that once they're put into operation, they run uninterrupted for 30, 40, 50 years with precise annual consumption. So the demand growth is there, you can calculate the demand. You can look out decades and decades in front of you. And it's the supply side that's fragile and tougher to track. And that's why the uranium companies out there that um, have good projects will have great exposure and provide um, some real leverage to investors because as the price moves back and investment dollars flow into the space, the choices are quite limited. Well, Jim, thank you for providing such a great answer to my rhetorical question there. And on that note, I, <laughs> on that note, I want to thank you. This is a great time to get a piece done about uranium. We'll have to see if the news from yesterday ends up continuing to prop the sector up or if this is more of a false start and we have to wait until the reactors actually come online. It's going to be an exciting year, though, either way. Uh, it could be a false start, but I mean, the real drive is the growth. And the growth is exactly what you said coming from China coming from Russia. These are, are, are nations that are marching forward in terms of reactor growth, and they will be driving the industry for years to come. Awesome, Jim. Thanks so much. Thanks, Colin. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen? Are you too stupid? <laughs>